Windows NT4 arrived at a moment when the internet was only just beginning to find its feet. In 1996, most people were still dialing in, websites were simple, and the idea of putting a workstation directly on the public internet wasn't something many businesses even considered. NT was built for stability, for file servers, for local networks, and not for the tangled web of encryption certificates and security standards that would come later. But the foundations laid in systems like this shaped the next decade of computing. They were never intended to speak the language of today's internet. Yet, with enough patience and a few modern tricks, you can sometimes coax them into doing surprising things. So, as this installation completes, we're going to take a look at what NT4 can still manage in 2025 and how far it's possible to push a system that predates much of the modern internet. Windows NT Workstation is one of my favourite operating systems. It was probably the first big boy operating system I got to work on. I thought to myself, I've seen lots of videos of people putting Windows 95 on the modern internet, but what about NT4? So in this video, I'm going to connect NT4 to the live internet. I'm going to show you how to use a proxy via my Mac to actually get better rendering of web pages. We'll do a little something with Telnet. And then at the end of the video, I'm going to get Outlook Express to connect to my Gmail account and send and receive emails from 2025. So let's get cracking in this one. Before we can connect NT to anything, it needs one thing it definitely doesn't have out of the box. And that's a working network card. Kimu offers several emulated network cards, but the closest match to something Windows NT can actually talk to is the AMD PCNet family. It's a fairly faithful emulation of a late 90s PCI network adapter, and on paper it should work perfectly with NT4. The problem is that NT predates a lot of this hardware, and the built-in driver library simply has no idea what this card is. So although Kimu presents a perfectly valid nick to the virtual machine, NT just sees unknown device and stops right there. Eventually, I found a later driver package from the year 2000, back when some vendors were still releasing updates for legacy systems. It's not something you'd stumble across by accident, but once installed, NT suddenly understands the emulated adapter. Once that driver is in place, everything falls into line. NT recognizes the card immediately, binds to TCP, loads the networking services without complaint, and at this point, we have, finally, a functioning TCP IP stack from 1996 running inside Kimu, complete with all its quirks and limitations. One thing that was really important with Windows NT was reinstalling the service pack every time you added new hardware or changed system components. NT would often ask for files from the original i386 folder, and when it did that, it quietly overwrote newer system files with the older ones from the CD. That meant your machine could suddenly roll back to a pre-service pack state without warning. So the best practice in the 90s was simple. Whenever you installed a driver or added a network card, you immediately reran the service pack to bring everything back up to date again. The most modern browser Windows NT4 can run is Internet Explorer 6 Service Pack 1, released back in 2001. By that point, Microsoft had already moved on to Windows 2000 and XP, so IE6 SP1 became the absolute end of the line for Internet Explorer on anything older. It was as far as NT would ever go, and even though it was considered modern at the time, today it carries none of the security, encryption or web standard support that the modern internet expects, which makes using it in 2025 a very interesting experience. NT finishes starting up and a login with Control alt delete As the desktop appears, Internet Explorer 6 sets itself up in the corner. I close a welcome screen, open IE, and the old connection wizard appears. I choose Connect via LAN, which wasn't common for home users back in the late 90s. And now, the browser's finally ready to open. When Internet Explorer finally opens, the first thing I try is a modern website, something simple like Wikipedia or BBC News, but IE6 can't load either of them. Today, almost every major site requires HTTPS with modern versions of TLS and far new cipher suites than anything NT has ever supported. NT's SSL stack tops out at SSL 2 and 3, both long retired, and IE6 simply can't negotiate a secure connection. It can't even complete the initial redirect to the secure version of a page. So as far as the modern web is concerned, Internet Explorer on NT just hits a brick wall the moment it tries to go online. 68k.news is effectively a lightweight, text-first reconstruction of Google News, originally designed for vintage Macs with limited browsers. And at first, it loads surprisingly well in Internet Explorer 6. The front page comes up without too much trouble. But the moment you try to open an actual article, it all falls apart. So you're left with a homepage that works and a website you can't actually read. At first, I assumed this was just NT running into its usual limitations. But then I tried exactly the same links in Chrome on my Mac and I got the same result there as well. The article pages simply wouldn't load, which makes it clear this isn't an NT problem at all. It's an issue with the site itself. Before I can install Opera, I have to install the Windows installer service for NT. Opera normally tries to download this automatically, but of course it can't. The download uses HTTPS and NT simply can't make that connection. So I install the MSI runtime manually, the way you would have done on older systems, just to give NT the ability to run modern installers at all. When I try to install Opera, the setup program immediately runs into a long-standing bug. The installer loops on itself, endlessly checking whether a copy of Opera is already running. 
even when nothing is running at all. It never gets past that point. This kind of behavior was surprisingly common with late era Windows NT applications. By the early 2000s, installers were becoming much more sophisticated and relied on newer APIs that were introduced in Windows 2000 and XP. NT4 simply doesn't have those functions. So even though the Opera browser itself is perfectly capable of running on NT, the installer that delivers it often isn't, leaving you to have to find more creative ways to get the program onto the system. Even though the Opera installer can't complete, it still unpacks a large number of files into a temporary folder before it gets stuck in that loop. And this is actually really useful because inside that directory, you can see the full set of program files the installer was preparing to use, including the actual MSI package for Opera itself. So this gives us a way forward. The installer might be broken, but it leaves behind the tools we need. In the next step, I can take that MSI, run it from the command line and extract its contents properly into a clean folder. And from there, we'll be able to launch Opera directly, bypassing the faulty setup routine entirely. Now that I've located the real Opera MSI in the temporary folder, I can extract it properly using the command line. I open a command prompt and then type in the extraction command. MSI exec slash A, C, NTN Opera, Opera MSI, target directory, C, Opera. This tells Windows installer to unpack the MSI into a normal folder instead of trying to run the broken setup routine. And once I press enter, you can see the files begin to extract into C, Opera, giving me a clean, complete copy of Opera that I'll be able to run directly in the next step. Running Opera directly from the extracted folder works perfectly. Everything it needs is right there, the executable, the resources, and all the libraries it depends on. Browsers from this era were surprisingly portable, so Opera runs quite happily without needing an installer or any registry setup at all. With Opera up and running, the first thing I try is the old Opera website. It loads a tiny bit of HTML, just enough to prove the browser's alive, but the page is mostly broken. Next, I try something a little bit more demanding, news.bbc.co.uk, and Opera can't render anything at all. No text, no images, not even an error message from the server. And this really shows what the limit of NT can do on its own. Even with a more modern browser than Internet Explorer, it simply can't speak the language the modern web expects. So if we want Opera to load anything useful, we're going to have to give it a bit of help later on in this video. Before web browsers took over the internet, text-based services were still a huge part of everyday online life, and Windows NT supported them perfectly. One of the real joys of the NT era networking is Telnet the simple no-frills protocol that connected you to bulletin boards, text-based game servers, early chat systems, and plenty of other services that lived entirely in plain text. Telehack is a modern recreation of thousands of late 90s Telnet services, and it includes one of the oldest internet Easter eggs, the ASCII Star Wars animation, which started development in 1997. And in 2025, Windows NT4 can still stream it flawlessly because the protocol hasn't changed. On my Mac, I'm running Web1, a lightweight modern proxy designed specifically to help older browsers survive on today's internet. What it does is quite clever. It takes modern HTTPS traffic, complete with all the encryption and security layers that didn't exist in the 90s, and translates that back to simple HTTP that Windows NT can understand. In other words, it becomes kind of a compatibility bridge between 2025 and 1996. Once Web1 is running, I can point both Internet Explorer 6 and Opera to it by changing their proxy settings. From that moment on, NT doesn't attempt to secure connections itself. Instead, it hands all encrypted traffic over to the Mac, which negotiates the modern HTTPS session, fetches the data, and sends back a simplified plain text version of the page. It's a technique very similar to what enterprise gateways used to do in the early 2000s when older systems needed access to newer services. And the difference is immediate. Internet Explorer can now load BBC News far enough to actually display a few images, which is far more than it could manage before. But that's also where it reaches its limit, i.e. 6 has no understanding of today's JavaScript heavy layouts or modern CSS or any of the dynamic features websites rely on. So even with Web1 doing the heavy lifting, NT browsers can only go so far. And this is where we need to bring in a more powerful solution later on. Opera behaves a little differently from Internet Explorer when the proxy is in place, and technically that gives it an advantage. With Web1 handling all the modern TLS negotiation, Opera receives every site as plain HTTP, a format its 2001 rendering engine can process reliably. That alone allows it to reach pages that IE simply refuses to touch. And as you can see this clearly, when I load Wikipedia, Opera begins to assemble the page slowly, starting with the raw HTML structure. Basic text elements appear, followed by simplified layout components. Anything depending on JavaScript or modern CSS is ignored because the engine doesn't understand those at all but the core markup still renders. So even though the page is incomplete, it demonstrates that with the right transition layer, Opera on NT can interact with parts of the modern web at a technical level IE6 cannot approach. For the final part of this experiment, I wanted to prove a point that Outlook Express 6 on Windows NT could still fetch email in 2025. And with a little help from Stunnel, I set out to make it work. 
So I set up Outlook Express to collect pop email, but instead of connecting directly to Gmail, it connects to my Mac running Stunnel. That way, NT speaks plain, unsecured pop, and Stunnel handles the modern encrypted connection on its behalf. As I enter the pop details into Outlook Express, Stunnel is listening on port 110 for NT's plain pop3 connection, and then handing it off to Gmail over a fully encrypted TLS session. It effectively bridges the gap between NT and a modern mail server. As I enter the POP3 login details into Outlook Express, there are a couple of things you have to set up on the Gmail side for this to work. Firstly, POP3 access has to be explicitly enabled in your Gmail settings. It's switched off by default. And because Gmail no longer accepts normal passwords for older clients, you also need to generate an app-specific password. Google calls this a less secure app because it bypasses modern authentication, but it's the only way a 1990s mail client like Outlook Express can log in. Now, once both of these are in place, NT can finally attempt a connection. And it works. Outlook Express running on Windows NT4 is collecting email from a 2025 Gmail account, thanks to Stunnel translating the connection. With everything configured, I now tested whether Outlook Express could actually communicate with a modern Gmail account. I composed a message and sent it to my work address. And I fully expected this to be the point where the whole thing would fall apart. But about 20 seconds later, my Google Pixel phone, as shown on the screen, display the email or message arriving exactly as it should. It delivered from NT through Stunnel into Gmail. I replied to that message from the phone and then went back to NT, Outlook Express, connected again through Stunnel, checked for new mail and retrieved the reply without any issues. A pretty remarkable moment. Software from the late 90s exchanging mail with Google's modern infrastructure, still functioning reliably with the right transition layer in between. There we have it. Windows NT workstation live on the internet. Ultimately, using Internet Explorer and Opera kind of ended up where I expected it to be. Even using Web1 proxy didn't really render any web pages properly. You couldn't say you would use that in any foreseeable, meanable way today. However, Outlook Express was quite a surprise for me. With Stunnel running, I was able to send and receive Gmail via Outlook Express. So theoretically, I could sit on an Outlook Express computer and use it for day-to-day -day email, which was not what I was expecting. And it was an enjoyable experience to get to that point. If you enjoyed the video, please let me know in the comments. Give me a like and a subscribe as I try to grow the channel. And we continue on with more of my experiences and adventures with the world of business IT in my entire career. So that's the end of this video. And I'll see you on the next one. Ta-da!